Hello and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I'm your host, Eric Fisher, and this is the show where we talk to the people behind the productivity. This week I'm sharing with you a conversation I had with Dan Schaubel. Dan is a New York Times bestselling author and is the research director at Future Workplace and the founder of both Millennial Branding and WorkplaceTrends.com. In this conversation, Dan and I talk about his new book, Back to Human, How Great Leaders Create Connection in an Age of Isolation. And the whole gist of this conversation is about using technology and when not to use technology to connect with your team or to get your team to connect with you, how to manage a team, in other words. It's, it's all about technology and the best case scenario to use it and when not to, et cetera. It is a really interesting conversation. It's one of my geek out places because, you know, I love technology and talking about this application when it comes to the human experience. So the words back to human really struck out to me. So I'll get out of the way and enjoy this conversation with Dan Schaubel. This week, it is my privilege to welcome to the show, Dan Chabel. Dan, welcome to the show. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. So I'm all about this topic, by the way. Uh, and, and you do such a great job of tying this topic in to productivity in the book. The book is, of course, called How Great Leaders Create Connection in an Age of Isolation. But more importantly, the actual title, that was just the subtitle, the actual title is Back to Human. I'm curious, where have we stopped being human and why do we need to get back to it? Yeah, I think it's less about going back to just focusing on phone calls and in-person communication and more of a reminder that we're overusing and misusing technology and it's created the illusion of hyper-connectivity when in reality we've created a lot of acquaintances and weaker relationships. There's a really interesting study that found that if you have an average of 150 Facebook friends, only three uh, people would actually call you in an emergency. So that's real friendship is when people are there for you in the toughest times. And, you know, anytime people go to an event, you know, they think that they're meeting all these new people, they had them on Facebook, but are they really your friend? You might not even see them ever again for the rest of your life. So I, I think that's what happens personally, but also professionally, because, you know, in the workforce, we might think that we have really strong relationships with our coworkers. But in reality, what we're really doing is texting and emailing and having lunch by ourselves at our cubicle. So it's actually we've created our own barriers through technology when we should use technology as a bridge to deeper human connection, which is what our basic need is. In Maslow's hierarchy of needs after, you know, safety and food and shelter, it's love. Or you, and if you don't have that, you're not going to be self-actualized. You're not going to be able to perform, perform at your very best in the workplace. And that, you know, is not good for your team. It's not good for your company. And I guess you could say the community and world as a whole, right? So you won't maximize your capabilities and those capabilities create value for others. Actually, the whole Maslow's hierarchy, my thought there is even aside from technology, I don't know that a lot of people that are managing teams are thinking about their coworkers or their team members in that way of providing channels or avenues for them to have fulfillment in life, right? Yeah, it's really sad. Actually, I read one report that said 20, only 20% 20 of leaders actually have offsites and social events for their team. Yet, when I was doing research, I interviewed over 2,000 managers and employees in 10 countries with Virgin Pulse. And we found that yeah, like the number one way to create a more human workplace and culture is to have social events. You know, there's a whole comedy sketch I did for the book of a birthday office birthday party from 1980 versus today. In 1980, people were in the moment. They were, you know, there to really celebrate with the birth birthday boy or girl. But now and today, people are more concerned about the likes and comments they get from the pictures they take at the birthday party rather than actually spending time celebrating in the moment with the birthday boy or girl. So I think that's broken. And we and this book is a reminder that human connection is really important. And as you get older, naturally, you're going to feel this because after age 25, you start losing a lot of friends. You know, when you're, you know, in your 80s or 90s, hopefully you live that long. You know, it's not like you have a hundred friends anymore. So, you know, it's thinking about who you want to be connected to, working with the right people, because really what works about is the work you're doing and who you're doing it with. It's less about what company you work for. 
because your day to day is orchestrated by, you know, having work that's meaningful and working for somebody that is very empathetic, cares about you and wants you to succeed. And if you don't have those, you're going to leave. You're just not going to last long at that company. Um, and now we live in a world where people are job searching on their phone. They're spending four hours a week doing that on their mobile phone. Like you can find opportunities quite easily. And so it, a company is not creating a really good work culture that is safe, secure, harnesses creativity, promotes innovation, uh, then it's going to be really hard for you to succeed. And the company is, it's going to cost the company a lot of money because turnover is high. And the other, the other thing is burnout leads to high turnover too. We found in, in another study, um, you know, if you continue to work your employees to death and don't pay them more, and, you know, expect them to respond to emails on uh, vacation and after work hours, they're going to end up leaving anyways. You know, not having your phone is the new vacation. That's what right. I say. <laughs> that's, yeah, I, that's in great. almost every presentation, I stand in front of an audience. I say, how many people have responded to a business email on vacation? And 99.5% of people raise their hand. The only maybe one person out of 1,000 or 4,000 that doesn't raise their hand is answering email. <laughs> because they're in the middle of it right and, then and email there. email is the biggest culprit at work too yeah yeah what we found in the study with virgin is you know people would much rather send an email than have a face-to-face conversation yet what we found in the virgin study is that people would much rather send an email than have a face-to-face conversation yet in a study by the harvard business review they found that one face-to-face conversation is more successful than 34 emails back and forth. So instead of, you know, sending all these emails and potentially being misunderstood and thinking that maybe if you add an emoji to an email, you'll be more understood, even though it makes you seem more incompetent. uh, All you have to do is walk two feet and say what you actually mean to your coworker. And, and, you know, in the most basic way, I think technology can be useful. I think it can lead to more human interaction if used properly. For instance, using a Outlook or Google Calendar, maybe some artificial intelligence to eliminate some of the tedious tasks at work of scheduling things. And But once you're in that meeting, be physically pr- present, right? So I'm seeing more and more leaders who are forcing people to put their phones in the middle of the table, even at home, in the dining room table, more and more parents are, are forcing everyone to put their phones in the middle of the table so they can have real conversations. And it's just so important because, you know, that's where creativity comes from. Happiness and creativity come from other people. Before we even get into any of the the dynamics of remote working, um, let's take a little bit of time to talk about like I before I ever became a remote worker or even managed a team remotely, which both of those are cr- currently true for myself. I was in a cubicle farm, and even then we had instant messenger uh, AOL instant messenger installed so that we could shoot each other messages across you know the the floor. And, you know, so, and, and, and there was a productivity state to that in a sense where it was like, Hey, this is, this is a, uh, without having to write out an email or even get up and go ask one question, it was a quick, Hey, did you do that yet? Kind of a thing. And, and so it's easy to start down. I hate to say the term slippery slope, but I guess that is kind of it. Like once you get used to it of how, you know, low hanging fruit, how easy it is to start down using technology for little things, which are good things to then start to overuse it or rely on it too much. Remote work is such a big topic. I've worked remote for eight years. And while everyone talks about the light side of remote work, which is the ability to work when and where and however you want, I found through the Virgin study that there is a dark side. It causes loneliness and isolation and lack of team and organizational commitment. If you work remote, you're much less likely to say you want to long-term create your company. To me, that's profound because if you're not getting human interactions, if you have weaker relationships with your colleagues, you are very disconnected and you're already checking out. You're already looking for other opportunities because your organization and team does not fulfill your needs. That's very interesting. So you've been doing this for eight years working from home. I'm I'm on a little over four years now. And I I think I realized it right away. I was like, oh, my gosh, this is not all it was cracked up to be like the great great. I have freedom. That also means I have freedom to like sit down and watch TV now. And there's no one here to like hold my hand to a certain extent, you know. 
Yeah. And it's all about touch points in the work workplace. Like that's why you should give more recognition. That's why you should share what you know, like this chap we have in the book back to human. We have many chapters on this, right? Because each one is a touch point, sharing an article, picking up the phone and having a meeting or a one-on-one face-to-face conversation in the workplace, all touch points, recognizing an employee for a great job they did, touch point. And all of those add up to increasing engagement. And sadly, 85% of the global workforce is either disengaged or actively disengaged in their job. So people are just not very happy in the workplace. And guess what? That affects your personal life. If you have a bad day at work, you're going to be complaining to people in your personal life. And that's going to affect those relationships. That's why I've dedicated so much of my life to helping companies improve their workspaces and making them more healthy and exciting for employees. Because if you get work right, it has a huge impact on someone's life. And we spend a third of our lives working. So, you know, if I can take care of a third of your life, that's a pretty big deal. Yeah, it's a huge percentage. And and I think they're they're right there. It goes back to that whole saying of, you know, work life balance, which creates this kind of false sense that either you're either working or you're living and that what you're doing when you're working isn't living. Exactly. It's all intertwined. I mean, I interviewed last year Richard Branson. I've interviewed him several times, but I asked him about friends at work and work life, you know, quote unquote work life balance. And he said that if you have you know, a bunch of friends outside of work, you should have an equal amount of friends in the workplace, Mm -hmm. right? And because we're working so many hours, we're always kind of working, whether we're, you know, in a physical space or not. And therefore, you got to really like who you're working with. You're spending so much time with them, you know, and, you know, it's like the old Jim Rome quote, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Um, And that's not just in terms of intelligence, it's in terms of happiness and well-being. And there's a direct link to, you know, human connection and overall happiness, right? It, the more time you spend with people, especially people who, you know, care about you and you care about them, you know, the happier you'll be. It's not about money. It's not about fame. It's not about, you know, job title. It's about other people. And I think that technology has created a huge network for me. I think it, I think it can be very useful in the workplace in certain situations. But, you know, if you have an office conflict, you know, doing it over text or firing an employee over text is probably not the smartest thing to do because it requires a lot more emotion and expressing intense emotion over text is just faulty. It just doesn't work really well and it could ruin future uh, opportunities and relationships. So, you know, for those situations, you want to meet with people in person and really go over things and take time with them because, because they're hard conversations. You know, and people want to avoid difficult conversations, especially people in my generation. You don't learn how to handle conflicts in college. College, you know, teaches you history and writing, which is important and various other topics. Uh, But you don't learn life skills. You have to figure that out over time, sadly. And those skills become increasingly important as you become a leader within an organization, because it's less about you doing the physical work and more about you're getting influencing other people to get that work done so that you can manage them and lead them to something great, right? Like the old management style was command and control, which is all about, you know, following policies and procedures. The new management style is about encouraging the best in others and creating a collaborative atmosphere where everyone feels included. People want to feel like they belong to something that's bigger than them. They want to make an impact on the team, the leader, the CEO, the, you know, partners, uh, the world at large, communities, like that's what people are looking for, you know, because that gives them meaning and it gives them excitement and through that positive energy, their entire life becomes better. You were talking a second ago about the, the old management style. And to me, that comes across almost like the military, except the military has something good going for it where you're actually in the trenches with somebody and you learn to rely on them. Whereas like the old management style, it was just basically here are your marching orders. Now go do it. And I'm glad we're starting to see that become the old way of doing things. I think part of the reason why it's happening is because organizations are becoming flatter. 
And and that's due to technology. That's an, a, a positive of technology, right? It's flat and like you can have a podcast. I can have a podcast. We can both have Facebook pages. Technology allows us to connect across, you know, across the organization, regardless of department or, you know, seniority. And so there's a lot of value there, right? That's really exciting. And, you know, it gives young people, a, a, you know, an edge like they never had before. But at the same time, if it's overused, um, you could annoy people or you just won't establish the type of relationships that are going to really impact your long term success and happiness. And so, like, I think we can use technology in a way where finding out information. But if we hoard that information and are selfish with it, we lose power and influence. And if we share it and help our team get better together then we become the leader that organizations need today in the future. And I think that, you know, all these new studies that, you know, I have coming out, not just the version one, but, you know, we have, I just had one come out with Oracle where we found that artificial intelligence is going to increase business process. It's going to eliminate a lot of the work that we don't want to be doing to free us up and give us time to focus on relationships and, and, you know, our emotional intelligence. And so, Yes, I think technology will eliminate a lot of jobs, but I think that if you go back to human, if you you focus more on establishing human relationships, that's the best job security you'll ever have, right? Because as you get older, it's not like your network becomes less important. It becomes the only way of getting a job. If you want to be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, it's like 100% through relationships. There's no handouts at that level, right? you know, it's all like relationships with maybe staffing firms or former CEOs. It's not, you're not going to get that job by searching on monster.com. Exactly. And and though technology can be helpful for things like monster.com and again, for disseminating and collecting information, we want to use tech for the positives, but be, a, you know, be self-aware and use less of it when it starts to undermine the most important thing, which are those relationships. In terms of relationships, and see, this is where, you know, and so if we go back to it, the, you had said the thing about the, you know, uh, uh, you can remind me of the stats again, but basically sending 34 emails back and forth is a useless use of the technology, though it allows us to do that. Uh, it's much better to have the face to face. But again, if you're remote working, then you've got to rely on doing kind of like a, a video call or even a voice call, like even a voice call is better than doing emails at that point. I have found personally, for sure. I agree. And actually, we did a study of 25,000 employees in many countries, and we found that technology is making us more human in a, in a sense where, you know, it's forcing out our basic human instinct. That's why you see, you know, meditation retreats and, <laughs> and uh, you know, these big festivals happening is because we've been using technology so much that, like, psychologically, we have to get away from it somehow. And we, we and, and that's why I think, you know, the experience economy is upon us too. Uh, it's something that I talk about in the book. And so I think what's happening is the more we're using technology, the more it's forcing us to pick up the phone, the more it's making us more aware of how we're coming off because uh, we still have this need, this need to connect. And when that's not served, it's just psychologically happening without us even thinking about it. Uh, but at the same time, I think, you know, it can be very isolating and it's so fascinating. Like living in New York city, if you're in the subway, you could be around so many people yet no one at the same time because people are physically there, but they're not mentally, emotionally, or spiritually there. So I think it's really important to recognize what's happening. You're seeing it every day, especially if you live in a major city. And then to just become more self-aware of what, how you're using it and how you can use it better. Uh, the book does hit technology pretty hard, as, you, as you've seen, mm-hmm. but only to make bigger points about how and when and where we're using it. Um, and again, it's, it's a path to human connection. It's, you know, early in my career, building up a strong network online in the blogging world back in 2006, 7, 8, 9, uh, but then eventually meeting all my fellow bloggers over time, right? And that's how I became friends with them. To have an extended pen pal and never actually meet with them, it wouldn't have been the same relationship. So using the technology to reach out to find your tribe and then connecting with them in a human way, I think is so important. Yeah. And I've, I've 
have a very similar uh, experience with, you know, making a lot of connections online, but then, uh, you know, then transferring that over to IRL in real life, as, as the phrase goes. And in a weird way, then taking that in real life connection at say a conference or something like that, that you, you know, you've finally face to face meet with the people that you've been interacting with uh, through technology mainly. And then you've got a face and you've got a name and even a handshake and a hug and, and all of that. And then you take that back out to your uh, you know, back to your day to day. And, and that's why, again, uh, honestly, even for remote workers, uh, whether you're managing a team or you're part of a remote team, that having the cost ponied up and say, look, it's important for us to meet face to face every so often so that we can make that deeper connection, because then it reminds us that we do, in fact, have that relationship. Yeah, even if it costs the company money to fly 20 employees to a specific location at least one time a year, it's, it makes such a difference, such a difference. Yeah. Video conferencing, I think, is is good, but it's nothing will ever replace face to face. No virtual reality, no augmented reality. You're still going to need FaceTime, and you know, even for your career, if you're not seen and heard, you're probably not going to have positive career uh, prospects, right? Because there's been a lot of research on, you know, people who get more FaceTime are more elevated in their careers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because there's one thing to deliver on projects was another thing to be seen delivering on that project. It it carries more weight. True, true. Yeah. Uh, So I know there's a lot of people who listen to the show who are either a remote worker where they they work for themselves or they work as part of a bigger team. I know there's people out there also like me who are not just part of a bigger remote team, but also manage a remote team. And I'd love to get some of your insight in terms of How can we be better at being remote workers and managing remote workers for that matter when we're and combat that loneliness, but also, you know, again, make some of these connections that need to be made? Great question. I focus on work life integration in the book because what I've done as someone who's worked remote is I've come up with the, you know, three personal and professional things I want to do every day. And then I look at my calendar and I just plot them in the calendar. So many people of us use the calendar just for meetings, yet I I use it for personal and professional. And I'm committed to doing certain activities on a daily, weekly, monthly, annual basis. Uh, So when I have, when I set annual goals, I backtrack and I say, okay, what do I need to do this quarter? What do I need to do this month, week, day? And then I just plot it in the calendar. I'm like, okay, I I want to go to this event. I want to have lunch with this friend and I just keep blocking it out on the calendar. And because people, you know, live and die by their calendar, because if it doesn't exist on the calendar, it doesn't exist, you should use that psychology to your advantage and actually create a calendar that speaks to your entire life, not just work. And just set a goal to make sure you're meeting people. You're at events, you're having lunch and play to your strengths. I'm an introvert. I can't, it's very hard for me to go to an event with hundreds of people, but it's much easier for me to host dinners of 12. So know who you are and play to that because you assume that more people who work remote are introverts than extroverts because extroverts, you need that attention. I have friends who are extroverts. They, there's no way they could work from home. So I think it's really important to know who you are know what your needs are and how you best operate and then and then lean into who you are. So by leaning into who you are, if you're an introvert, that means, you know, smaller one-on-one meetings and dinners rather than massive events, right? And you don't, it's not about getting to know thousands of people. It's about finding the right people and investing in them. I am also an introvert as well. So, and even then I have a group of people, uh, you know, a handful of also remote worker people here in my small town that I'm like, Hey, let's, uh, let's go be around people, but really we'll hang out together and we'll say we, you know, we've got one specific thing that we want to both check off our to-do lists while we're there. And it's almost like an extra accountability as well. That's smart. My friend in Boston actually does that. And he told me the idea. He's like, yeah, we have, you know, four other friends who are like me and we're all working remote. So we, what we did is we committed to a 
co-working space. So we get to see each other once or twice a week. And I thought that was really smart. I haven't heard that too often, but it just makes a lot of sense because I think for introverts, you want to be alone, but you also want to be on, around other people. And I, I read some study this week, actually, that I thought was really interesting. It's like, you know, what makes for a productive, creative worker. And they said that uh, it's a mix of being by yourself, but then being around other people. You need both. Yeah, exactly. To think, yeah. to think independently and then as a group. Yep. Yeah. And, and again, as introverts, you know, we recharge by being by ourselves. But of course, then we're by ourselves and we can start to get lonely. So it's like, oh, I got to I got to jump back and forth between the hot and cold pool in a weird way. And you know what? Everyone can deal with this. Yep. Everyone is feeling this right now in America. Uh, there was a Cygnus study that found almost half of the population is lonely. Uh, in the UK, 9 million people are lonely. 200,000 older adults haven't spoken to a close friend or relative in the past month. Uh, loneliness has cost the UK economy 2.5 billion pounds per year. Uh, there's a minister of loneliness to handle the problem in the UK. Uh, Japan, you know, over 40,000 people die a year from loneliness. They're going to be losing 42 million people from their population by 2060 because partially because of their overuse of technology and their virtual reality girlfriends are not getting human contact and not reproducing and they have such an older population. So they have more people dying than being born in Japan, which is really scary. So, so I, you know, my book sell very well in Japan. So hopefully I can make an impact <laughs> with this book, especially because my, my first book was so focused on technology. Me 2.0 is at the beginning of the web, web 2.0 movement. So this is the pendulum has swung the other way now. We've gone too far. Uh, but uh, Japan and then you have France, they have the right to disconnect there. So you get fined if you right. email uh, uh, an employee after work hours. So, yeah, countries, governments, organizations are, are pushing back against this. Daimler in Germany, they have a mail on holiday program where if you email a coworker when they're on vacation, the email is automatically deleted, which creates the behavior that you give people space. I was starting to read some of that about some of those different, uh, you know, new, those new laws. And I, I'm just fascinated to the fact that we've gotten to that place. But in, think, in China, in yeah. China, I just read about they have a zombie lane. So it's like an additional sidewalk for people who are just looking down at their phones while walking. Oh, gosh. Wow. So it's a global issue for sure. Yeah. I mean, there's no question. Everyone can relate to this. I think there's what, like 3 billion people who have internet access. So certainly I wonder, you know, there'd be a really cool study to compare the people around the world and do like a massive study of everyone <laughs> of people who have internet access for, versus don't and quality of life. I'd be so, that'd be so fascinating. That would, I mean, be covered everywhere, you know? Oh yeah. That would be, that would be amazing. Uh, so one other thing I want to ask is again, we're trying to, really lean into the positives of the technology and use it for creating connection. And so for me personally, I'm curious, what are some of the ways that somebody like me who does lead a remote team, what are some of the best ways I can use technology and be aware of my team's well-being and not maybe overstep with them? Well, I want for personal use, I think rescue time dot com is valuable because it shows you how much time you're using on the social networks, on web apps, on all that. I think for communicating with your team, it's about having a weekly team meeting. We do ours every Monday at noon where it's every it's consistent. You know, everything consistent is, you know, what builds anything in life builds a following, builds connection and team, everything. So you got to be consistent. So every Monday at noon, we do that. And everyone's, you know, there. And, and I think just, you know, phone, random phone calls. I think that, you know, anytime when I have a lot of my mind, I don't want to put in an email. I just want to call someone. So I think how are you using it is really important, right? So depending on, you know, if there's a conflict you have with a teammate then you would want to pick up a phone or meet in person. If it's something, a quick reminder to join a conference call, I think you can do that via a text. So it's, you know, use cases. It's, you know, you're in this situation. This is when, and this is what I talk about in the book. It's like, you're in this situation. Here's how you should use technology or when to avoid it. And I think that's important. And then you just create habits. You know, the more you use technology, to organize meetings, that's a habit you're creating, right? You're, for me, it's I use Zoom.us or WebEx. And 
So th that technology is good because it's facilitating human interaction. It's facilitating webinars where I'm speaking and using my voice. It's facilitating conference calls when I'm interacting with my team. So it's being thoughtful around that and being aware of how you're using it and to be smarter about it. And that's one of the things we definitely have to keep in mind is the more of yourself, whether that's visually, especially auditory, um, as you're using different communication tools, that's also another way of being more human because it creates a deeper connection. And again, nothing, nothing substitutes face to face, but if you can still be face to face through digital or even voice to voice, you know, it, it, then it starts to slide down into text only and, you know, and, and it's not that it's not useful. It just starts to be less of a connection builder. Exactly. So yeah, if when, oh, you know, it's like I interviewed a hundred young leaders for the book from the top companies in the world and they all said that technology is a double edged sword. It's how you, how you're using it, right? It, it can be good or bad. Yeah. Well, and I, I, and I think what, what this book is showing is everyone talks about how great it is, but I'm saying, Hey, we have to be careful about how we're using it and not to overuse it because it can isolate us, which leads to loneliness, which leads to unhappiness. I think that's the great thing about the book is you're not just saying, look, all technology is bad or here's how to use technology to be super productive. You're saying it is the double edged sword. So here's the way you got to look at both sides of that coin and then come out ahead in terms of your team and in terms of your own well-being when you're being <laughs> when you're being more human in this current age of isolation. So I'm really looking forward to talking about this more with a lot more people. And I know that uh, the book's coming out. Go grab a copy. And where would you best like to direct them to? Yep. So you can buy a copy on Amazon or Barnes and Nobles or your local bookstore. And you can go to danshawbell.com, D-A-N-S-C-H-A-W-B-E-L.com for the research, the book, the articles, everything I produce, which is thousands of pieces of content over 12 years. And then you can listen to my podcast, which is Five Questions with Dan Shawbell, where I interview some of the world's success, most successful people in under 10 minutes by asking them five questions like Richard Branson and Condoleezza Rice and many, many others. Oh, and let's make sure to mention um, the work connectivity assessment as well. Yes. And you can also, if you want to take a free self-assessment to help you figure out how connected or disconnected you are from your teammates, you can go to workconnectivityindex.com now. Perfect. Yeah. So I will link up all of what we just talked about in the show notes and you will be able to find them uh, in the show notes for this episode. Dan, it's been awesome talking with you. I really know this book's going to do a lot of good. I'm glad to be able to talk to you about it. You got it, my friend. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Dan Shawbell. If it piqued your interest in terms of getting work done and specifically the role that technology has taken on and inserted itself into our lives for better or for worse, I'd love for you to further study that in his book, Back to Human, How Great Leaders Create Connection in an Age of Isolation. You can support this show by going to the links in the show notes for the book to purchase it. There you'll also find the links to Dan's site as well as the work connectivity index test if you're further interested in testing to see where you are at on that scale. Thanks again to Dan for talking with me and thanks again for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, I would love for you to do me a favor and share this episode with someone you know needs to hear it. You can do that at the show notes, again, beyond the to do list.com slash 249. And while you're there, hit the share button for whatever the best way is to reach that person you know needs to hear this episode. And with that, I will see you next episode. <laughs>